Good afternoon, everyone. I wasn't meant to address you today, but I couldn't stay quiet after everything I saw today, so I hope you bear with me. I had the honor of accompanying Jill Biden, the former second lady of the United States, Karen and Carolyn Miles, the president and CEO of Save the Children, and Sofia Kubelaki, um, the executive director of the Home Project, on a visit to the Suda refugee camp and hotspot Vial in Hios. Just to give you a little context, there were over 100 unaccompanied minors on the island between the ages of 8 and 17, and there were over 1,300 refugees in total. The children are not entitled to go to school because these camps are considered transient, places where sh children should not be for more than a month before being returned to Turkey. Priority for reasylum in Athens is given to boys under the age of 12 and girls under the age of 18. However, we also heard that many shelters in Athens are closing due to a lack of funding and that those that are open do not have room. Ladies and gentlemen, I saw parents, children and people today who looked so hopeless. Some of the children are so stressed out that they have developed psychosis, they're psychotic. As a mental health professional, I can tell you that this is so rare and only occurs in one sixtieth of a percent of the child population. I can also tell you that psychosis in these cases is often due to the extremely stressful conditions of having children living in such an unnatural environment. In other words, the children are toxically stressed. The longer they stay, the more severe their symptoms. Did you know that there's only one child psychiatrist in Hios today? And appointments are very hard to come by. One mother admitted to me today that the earliest appointment she could get was October for her child who is psychotic and uncontrollable. She doesn't know if one day she'll wake up in the middle of the night and not find her. So she sleeps with one eye open. And for those of you who do not know what psychosis in a child of four looks like, let me paint a picture for you. Imagine a child rocking, arms flapping, seeing things and hearing things that are not real. How frightened would you be to see your child in that condition? And for those children who are not psychotic, a single mum told me that her daughter does not sleep. She cries all night long. She is so traumatized she cannot close her eyes. She's my daughter's age, two and a half years old. Can you imagine? Can you imagine having to give your two and a half year old a sedative to go to sleep every night? And can you imagine having to face your angry tent mates who just want to sleep and forget their misery? Can you imagine how much stress you would feel knowing, with your child crying, that the borders are closed, that asylum in Athens might not happen, and that you might be returned to Turkey. But you don't know when. It could be in one month, it could be in four months, it could be in nine months, it could be in three years, four years. Nobody can tell you. Welcome to hell on earth. Trust me, if you go there, you'll understand what I'm talking about. The bathrooms are filthy, the food is inedible. One of the children showed us slugs in their food. Anyhow, as a therapist, I can tell you that there is nothing more destabilizing than uncertainty. It would be better for a refugee to know that he would spend the rest of his life in Hios or be returned to Turkey tomorrow. Psychologically speaking, it would be better. And the other thing I would say is that, you know, when people are traumatized, they can't learn. Children, you can give children as many opportunities as you want in education, but if they're fearful, they cannot learn. So any, any, any money that you spend on laptops and iPads, it's a waste of time because a child cannot learn well under those circumstances. I know I've painted a very, very bleak picture, but I must tell you that every single volunteer, 
every single hotspot staffer and supporting NGO staff, as well as the police, were working tirelessly to help these people in any way they can, to keep the peace, to try to give them as good a life as they humanly can. But they are absolutely overstretched. And when we asked about the mental health services, they were, there really weren't any, I have to be frank. And there's nothing more they can do. They just do what they can, and they continue to work heroically. And I want to give you an example um, of the extent to which the staffers go to help um, some of these children. One of the staffers, it was a long weekend here in Greece, um, and Monday, most people were off work. And some of the NGO staff were also off work. And therefore, some of the children could not get their medication because there was no one to administer it. And there was an, uh, an NGO staffer who actually came in on Sunday because she knew that the child would not have slept the night before. And she knew that if she waited until Tuesday, that would mean three nights of a child crying all night long. So she came on Sunday and she gave the child the sedative and at least that child had one good night's sleep. But the NGO staffer could get into a lot of trouble for doing that. So I just wanted to share that with you because there are some really incredible people working there. And the saddest part of today is that many of the NGOs are only funded through the end of June and they have no idea what's going to happen to them. They have no idea what's going to happen to the services that they've been providing. They have no idea who's going to take over those positions. And, I, and the conditions are so terrible right now, I can't imagine how they're going to deteriorate when this happens, when all the Save the Children people go, when Praxis leave, I just have no idea. And I also believe that the conditions could, could become so bad that there could be civil unrest. You do feel when you walk through Suda that there is extreme tension and you can understand it from every single side, from the, from the refugees to the, to the residents, you're two steps away. If somebody moved in on your front in the garden in front of your house, you would, you would find it very uncomfortable too. And I, and, and I will again say it, they're doing, the police are doing an incredible job, the NGOs are doing an incredible job. Um, but, you know, we really can use everybody's help in this room. And I really hope that the conversation today will prove instrumental in creating solutions. I do believe that we have capacity as a nation, as a group of people, and we're very resourceful. And I do believe we can find solutions today. Thank you so much for listening.